Well, since this network and other news organizations called the presidential election on Saturday, November 7th, 2020, every day of Donald Trump's life has been worse than the day before. Today is $464 million worse than yesterday for Donald Trump and his children. There was no suspense, really, in today's judicial finding in the civil fraud case brought against Donald Trump by New York Attorney General Letitia James. Jury verdicts are always suspenseful. You never know what juries are thinking, but it was always very clear what the fact finder in this case, Judge Arthur Ngoron, was thinking. It was very clear what any reasonable person would think when confronted with the evidence in this case. In his ruling today, which cost Donald Trump and his children $463.9 million, including interest. Judge Ngoron wrote, in order to borrow more and at lower rates, defendants submitted blatantly false financial data <clears throat> to the accountants, resulting in fraudulent financial statements. When confronted at trial with the statements, defendants, fact and expert witnesses simply denied reality and defendants failed to accept responsibility or to impose internal controls to prevent future recurrences. That's the essence of the case. So as of tonight, because of Donald Trump's stupidity and recklessness as a businessman and because of Donald Trump's utter depravity in raping E. Jean Carroll in the 1990s, Donald Trump owes a total of $551 million in legally enforceable judgments against him in the state of New York. And the interest is ticking on that total amount every day that it remains unpaid. That means the interest on what Donald Trump owes, in this case, won by Attorney General Letitia James, and in the case cases, the two cases, one by E. Jean Carroll, is increasing at a rate of $1 million per week. That's the interest right now that's running on what Donald Trump owes in all of these cases, $1 million a week. To appeal those cases in the state of New York, Donald Trump has to literally put up or shut up. He has to put up the money in question in order to appeal the New York cases. So Donald Trump has exactly 22 days left before he must deposit the $83 million that he owes E. Jean Carroll in an account controlled by the court so that he can appeal that case. If he loses that appeal, that $83 million immediately goes to E. Jean Carroll. She won't have to chase Donald Trump for the money. Donald Trump has already deposited the $5 million in an account controlled by the court while he is appealing the first verdict against E. Jean Carroll that E. Jean Carroll won in court. Donald Trump has 30 days to deposit $463 million in an account controlled by the court so that he can appeal this business fraud case. Tonight, Donald Trump needs the kind of $2 billion surge of Saudi money into his business that his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, got from the Saudis after the Trump presidency. If foreign sources of money like that don't bail out Donald Trump, it is unlikely that the Trump businesses will experience a surge of income that is able to absorb the half a billion dollars in legal judgments that Donald Trump now faces with hundreds of millions of dollars in legal judgments likely to land on him in the lawsuits pending against him in Washington, D.C., filed by police officers for the injuries that they suffered at the hands of the violent Trump mob on January 6th. Donald Trump will be barred from running businesses in the state of New York for three years. His two children, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump, will be barred from running businesses in New York for two years. After crushing the Trump boys and their business in court today, New York Attorney General Letitia James said this. I want to be clear. White collar financial fraud is not a victimless crime. When the powerful break the law and take more than their fair share, there are fewer resources available for working people, small businesses and families. And everyday Americans cannot lie to a bank about how much money they have in order to get a mortgage to buy a home 
or a loan to keep their business afloat or to send their child to college. And if they did, our government would throw the book at them. I want to thank the entire incredible and hardworking team in my office that tried this case. Because the scale and the scope of Donald Trump's fraud is staggering. And so too is his ego and his belief that the rules do not apply to him. Today, we are holding Donald Trump accountable. We are holding him accountable for lying, cheating, and a lack of contrition, and for flouting the rules that all of us must play by. Because there cannot be different rules for different people in this country, and former presidents are no exception. This decision is a massive victory for every American who believes in that simple but fundamental pillar of our democracy, that the rule of law applies to all of us equally, fairly, and justly. Thank you. The second day of the hearing in Fulton County, Georgia, about the Trump co-defendant's motion to disqualify District Attorney Fawny Willis from the case began as Andrew Weissman predicted it would begin. Because Fawny Willis's lawyer decided not to ask her any more questions, that meant that the Trump team of lawyers did not get another chance to ask questions of Fawny Willis, and so she gave no more testimony today. Andrew Weissman predicted that would happen because it appeared from the Fawny Willis side of the case yesterday that she had established everything she needed to establish in that testimony yesterday, and there was no reason to continue it. Then Fawny Willis's lawyer called two witnesses in support of her testimony. The first witness was the former governor of Georgia, Roy Barnes, who was a highly experienced, is a highly experienced trial lawyer. He impressed everyone in the courtroom on both sides. He testified that Fawny Willis offered him the job of special prosecutor in charge of the case against Donald Trump and his co-defendants. His testimony refuted the Trump team lawyer's claim that Fawny Willis hired her boyfriend, Nathan Wade, for the job of special prosecutor so that she could then go on vacation trips with Nathan Wade and profit from his spending on her through the paycheck that she was giving him. That is the Trump team lawyer's theory of the case. Now that the testimony in the hearing is over, we can say that there was absolutely no evidence presented at all that Fawny Willis intended to profit from Nathan Wade's position or that she incidentally profited from that position in any way. Zero evidence for the fundamental reason that this hearing was held. Fawny Willis and Nathan Wade both testified that their romantic relationship began after Nathan Wade began working in the district attorney's office. Here was former Governor Barnes' testimony about why he didn't want the job of special prosecutor that eventually went to Nathan Wade. He didn't want to be the special prosecutor of the man who tried to overturn the presidential election in Georgia and sent a violent mob to attack the Capitol on January 6th. I'd lived with uh, bodyguards uh, for four years, and I didn't like it. And I wasn't going to live with bodyguards for the rest of my life. So the terrorism of Donald Trump and his mobs worked in that particular instance. There was shocking testimony in the late afternoon today when Terrence Bradley, who was Nathan Wade's law partner and was the first lawyer involved in handling Nathan Wade's divorce, took the witness stand and testified that he did have communication with the Trump team lawyer who filed this motion against Fawny Willis. But that wasn't the shocking part. The shocking part came on cross-examination by Fawny Willis's lawyer who revealed why Terrence Bradley might have been in contact with one of the Trump team lawyers. You left the firm. The firm remained the same as far as other employees, Mr. Wade, Mr. Campbell, as the main partners of the firm. You were the one who left, correct? That is correct. And you termed it as a disagreement 
you recall answering questions as though you left due to a disagreement? Yes? Yes. And that disagreement was that there was an allegation of sexual assault by an employee made against you, correct? That is incorrect. There was not an allegation that you assaulted us, that you sexually assaulted one of the employees in the firm. That is incorrect, but yes. Yes. Yes, there was an allegation that you sexually assaulted a member of the firm, correct? Yes, there was an allegation, yes. Did you sexually assault any clients of your firm? No. Never? Never. Who's Anna Rodriguez? I don't even know that name. You don't recall a client named Anna Rodriguez? Anna Rodriguez? No, I do not. Never met her? I do not recall the name Anna Rodriguez. The next witness the state would call would be Anna Rodriguez. Uh, question, Mr. Bradley, about the sexual assault of Ms. Rodriguez, a client of the firm. The judge did not allow that testimony by Anna Rodriguez, saying it was too far afield from the point, the essence of the hearing. The most impressive witness of the day was the man who helped make Fawny Willis who she is, her father, John Clifford Floyd III. He is a retired attorney who practiced law in Washington, D.C. and around the world, including working in South Africa with Nelson Mandela and working for four years in Rwanda. Fonnie Willis's father testified that he moved in with her in the summer of 2019 when Fonnie Willis had a boyfriend <clears throat> who was a DJ who was frequently at her house. That conflicts with the Trump team lawyer's claim that Fonnie Willis began dating Nathan Wade in 2019. Fawny Willis's father said he never once saw Nathan Wade at their home and never met him until this year. Mr. Floyd explained why his daughter had to move out of the house. There have been so many death threats, uh, uh, and they said they were going to blow up the house. They were going to kill her. They were going to kill me. They were going to kill my grandchildren. I mean, on and on and on. It just uh, it became, and I was concerned for her safety. The people who were threatening to kill him and his daughter and his grandchildren are the supporters of the clients of the lawyers who were all facing him in that room today, some of them questioning him. When the lawyer representing Donald Trump questioned Fonnie Willis's father, he handled the questioning, her father handled the questioning, as gracefully and as professionally as former Governor Barnes did. There wasn't even a hint of anything but professional respect that attorney John Clifford Floyd III showed to his fellow attorney, the lawyer for Donald Trump, the man who has called his daughter a racist, the man who has never, ever told his supporters not to threaten her life and not to threaten her father's life and not to threaten her children's lives. Because of security precautions now in place, Fonnie Willis's father doesn't get to see her very much anymore. I've only seen my, my daughter 13 times because I can't, and we've never seen each other more than maybe three hours because of, you know, the nightmare threats against uh, her and me. Yesterday, Fonnie Willis testified that her father always advised her to make sure she always had enough cash on hand to deal with whatever surprise might come her way. Your Honor, I'm not trying to be racist, okay? But... It's a black thing, okay? You know, I was trained, and most black folks, they hide cash, or they keep cash. And uh, I was, no, I trained, you always keep some cash, because uh, I've been places, and just because of the color of my skin, for example, I took a fellowship at Harvard when my daughter was just a, a if I might, Your Honor, if I might, when I was just a, she was just, you know, maybe three years old. And I remember going to a restaurant in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I had a American Express credit card and maybe a visa or whatever. And uh, I had a lot of um, what they call traveler's checks. I don't even know if they still have traveler's checks, but traveler's checks. And there was a sign said, you know, with the credit card. 
for whatever reasons, the man would not take my American Express credit card. So I pulled out my Visa card, and he wouldn't take my Visa card. So then I pulled out my traveler's checks. He said, we don't take checks. Now, this was, these were traveler's checks. This was money. I had a $10 bill. I'll never forget this as long as I live. And uh, he said, uh, uh, the bill for my wife at the time, uh, Fonny's mother, Fonny and myself, was like $9.95, and I had a $10 bill. That was all that. And I always remember that. Um, but even before that, I've always kept cash, I, you know, and I've told my daughter, you keep six months worth of cash always. For example, I had three safes in my house. Uh, I put some of my clients' stuff there, too, uh, things I didn't want other lawyers to be, I mean, because you're always in a firm, and I knew that there were special conditions. So some of my clients' things I would bring home, put them in the safe. But I've always kept safes. And as a matter of fact, I gave my daughter uh, her first cash box and told her, always keep some cash.